Poetic Designs by Stephen Adams, Chapter 3, Part 2, Beyond the Single Stanza. Beside the formal structure of the individual stanza, lyric poems sometimes feature devices that link the one stanza to another. A refrain like that in Campion's Cherry Ripe Above is a simple device that most per powerfully reminds us of the relation between lyric poetry and music. Even when it appears in a printed text, it can be almost any length in keeping with the proportions of the poem, from a single mon monosyllable or a nonsense phrase like the fa-la-la -la and the matter girls, to a single line, a couplet, of, or a full-blown separate stanza, repeated as chorus between the other verses. In general, it reinforces a sense of parallelism and connection from stanza to stanza. It usually reinforces the general mood of the poem, but can also question or contradict, yet see yeats, the apparitions. Refrains can also be varied to reflect progress from one stanza to the next. In Sir Walter Raleigh's The Lie, the refrain appears and gives the the world, the lie, then give them both the lie, give potentials or potents, potent, potentates, the lie. I'm so sorry if I mispronounce that, and so on. <clears throat> Sometimes the last appearance of a refrain is altered, creating a sense of closure. Herbert's virtue turns for the mo thou most. Thou that for thou must die, repeated three times into the chiefly lives. Although refrains usually appear between stanzas, they can also punctuate stanzas internally. The song that ends Shakespeare's Twelfth Night rotates two refrain lines. When that I was a li and a little tiny boy, with hey ho, the wind and the rain, a foolish thing was about was but a toy. For the rain it raineth every day, but when I came to a man's estate with hey ho, the wind and the rain gainst knaves and thieves men shut their gate. For the rain it raineth every day. Other linking devices between stanzas include patterned repetitions of words or phrases and the interlocking rhymes of rhymes. All of these devices are featured in the so-called French forms, see below. And in fact, English poetry has been rather negligent of them in comparison with some other languages, but they do appear. Frost, well known stopping by the woods, stopping by woods on a snowy evening, uses rhyme linked quatrains, A A B A, B B C B, C C D C, in the manner of the, of Terza Rima, a lyric from Eliot's Dry Salvages, borrows a device from Trabadours, a province rhyming from one stanza to the next, but not within the stanza itself, sustaining some very challenging rhymes through six stanzas. Where is there an end to of it? The soundless wailing, the silent withering of autumn flowers, dropping their petals and remaining motionless. There, where is there an end to the drifting wreckage, the prayer of the bone on the beach, the unprayable prayer at the calamitous annunciation. There is no end but addition to the trailing consequence of further days of, and hours while emotion takes itself, takes to itself the emotionless years of living among the breakage of what it was believed in as most reliable and therefore the fittest for renunciation. One can find in Sylvia Plath's Black Rook in rainy weather an extraordinary adap adaptation of this device. Elizabeth Barrett Browning's A Musical Instrument sustains a complex pattern through the seven stanzas their great god Pan is a refrain from phrase. The word river includes the second and last line of each stanza and the rhyme scheme A-B-A-C-C-B -C -C -B stays constant. 
What was he doing, the great god Pan, down in the reeds by the river, spreading ruin and scattering ban, splashing and paddling with hooves of a goat, and breaking the golden lilies afloat, with dragonfly on the river, he tore out a reed, the great god Pan. From the deep, cool bed of the river, the limpid water turbidly ran, and the broken lilies a dying lay, and the dragonfly had fled away, ere he brought it out of the river. With internal refrains and multiple ref refrains, linked rhyme schemes and refrain words or phrases, innumerable formal combinations become possible, limited only by the inventiveness of the poet or musician. Some virtuoso pieces. Excuse me. One should not pass it by the topic of rhyme and stanza without recognizing the brilliance and inventiveness of some, some poets have displayed. Rhyme, especially being the showiest feature of poetic form, has given poets many opportunities for virtuoso feats. The fields of light and popular verse have produced some of the most impressive of these. Theater Rhymester at, from W.S. Gilbert to Cole Porter to Stephen Soundheim have startled and delighted audience with their verbal dexterity. This is not surprising. Since rhyme is one of the elements of verse, technique most associated with play, on the other hand, poets at their most serious have hard, hardly restricted themselves to plain blank verse. As the writings of Herbert and Hopkins and Dylan Thomas testify, what follows is a small collection of inventive and one or two profound explorations of rhyme and stanza. For means of rhyming, for display are rhyming, on unusually unusual or seemingly impossible words, the troubadours called this scarce rhyme. Rhyming insistently on the same sound, rhyming in close proximity and rhyming in intricate or concealed patterns. These types do not exhaust the possibilities but cover many examples. Rhyming on unusual or almost impossible words is usually a comic effect through the Elliot example above shows a more serious tone. But O oh ye lords of ladies intellectual, inform us truly that they have they not henpecked you all beside this thoroughfare. The sale of half hose has long since superseded the cultivation of per Perian roses. Included in this group are those who twist words into rhyme. Farewell, farewell, you old rhinoceros. I'll stare at something less precarious. I'm so sorry. Also included would be macron, macronic rhymes, rhymes between two languages. Unaffected by the march of events, he passed from the man's memory in Lan Trentesme de son ig the case presence, no adjunct to the muse's diadem. In Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates of Penzance, one character sings a patter song in which he teases the audience by pretending to have difficulty finding the rhyme. I am the very old, very model of a model, major general. I have information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England, and I quote the fights historical. From Marathon to Waterloo, in order to categorical. I am very acquainted, too, with matters mathematical. I understand equations both simple and quadrilateral. And... About binomial theorem, I'm teeming with a lot of news. Lotto news, lotto news, ah. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse, rhyming relentlessly on the same sound has cosmic effects, but can also underscore a serious inevitability. My favorite example is Thomas Hardy's meditation on scientific approaches to the Bible. 
The respectable burger on the higher criti criticism, since Reverend Doctor now declare that clerks and people must prepare. To doubt if Adam ever were, to hold the, of the flood of local scare, to argue through the stolid stare that everything had happened ere. The prophets to its happening swear that David was no giant slayer. The poem continues for a full 36 lines, leaving the reader breathless and possibly agnostic. Rhyming in close proximity encompasses a surprising number of poems that use the echo convention. Fair rocks, goodly rivers, sweet woods, when shall I see peace? Peace, peace, what bars me my tongue? Who is it that comes me so nigh? I, oh, I do know what guests I have met. It is echo, tis echo. Well met, Echo, approach, then tell me thy will too, I will too. Also, there is Thomas Hood's amazing one-of-a-kind triple play. Even is come, and from the dark park hark, the signal of the setting sun, one gun and six is sounding from the chime. Prime time to go and see Drury Lane Dane slain, or hear Othello's jealous doubt spout out. The poem sustains this procedure for 34 lines. Hood's poem is an outrageous stunt in the same class with a number of unclassifiable rhyming tricks. George Herbert's very serious clever paradise uses AAA tercets subtracting from the rhyme one letter each line. I bless thee, Lord, because I grow among thy trees, which in I row, in a row, to thee both fruit and order. O, oh, what happened, force or hidden charm, can blast my fruit or bring me harm, while the enclosure is thine arm? The rhyming that I personally find more most fascinating, however, occurs in intricate patterns. This is a long history going back to the origins of rhyme itself in European literatures and is not confined to the comic. Here is the opening of a 15th century Scottish hymn to the Virgin Mary. Hail stern serpern, hail in a turn, in goddess seek to shine lucerne, endurn for to discern. Be glory and grace divine, hodiern, modern sentiern angelical regime our term or uh, our turn in fern for to disburn help rylas rosine intellectual rhymes have not seemed to interest the english poets to any great degree but there it was a spate of activity in the 1930s with impressive results a superb lyric by c day lewis begins do not expect again to a phoenix hour, the triple toward sun, the sky complaining sudden, the rain of gold and heart's first ease, tranced under trees by the eldritch light of sundown. This is not this is not blank verse, as first appears, but subtle internal rhyme that continues for three more stanzas. A well-known poem by W. H. Auden takes such a takes such devices to great lengths. Intriguing patterns of end rhyme, internal rhyme, and alliteration in a single intricate quatrain four times repeated, I have italicized the patterns. Oh, where are you going? said reader to writer. The valley is fatal where furnaces burn. Yonder's the midden whose door odors will maiden. That gap is the grave where the fall return. Hail, I'm sorry, that's the next page. I will close in on the thing so you can pause this and read this. Oh, do you imagine, said fear to far, that dusk will delay on your path to the past, to the pass, your diligent looking discover for lacking, your footsteps feel from granite to grass. These are just a few examples that illustrate but do not exhaust the possibilities of rhyme and stanza. 
English is often said to be poor in rhyme, and so it is compared with some other languages, but the inventions, inventiveness of poets is inexhaustible, and the desire to make patterns out of language is essential to human creative genius. For convenience, I have tabulated various kinds of rhyming and rhyme terms in Appendix 1. Some standard verse forms, fixed and not so fixed. The sonnet, excuse me. Besides its recognized stanza forms, English poetry also features a number of fixed forms. That is, forms that govern the design of entire poems, all of which have been imported from other languages. By far the commonest and best known of these is the sonnet have risen in Italian poetry. It, is, it was taken up by Dante and Peter Petrarch and then passed along to poets of the French Renaissance. Since its introduction from the Italian early in the 16th century by Wyatt, who translated, into, translated from Petrarch to, and wrote original sonnets and Surrey, who established the English form, and since the phenomenal craze that at the end of the century for sonnet cycles by Sidney Spencer, Shakespeare, Daniel, and many others, the sonnet has maintained a presence almost continuously in our poetry to the present day, with only the Augustan decade seeming to lack enthusiasm for the form. Unlike some of the less common fixed forms described below, the sonnet has shown high degree of flexibility. Textbook descriptions have not always followed suit. Students are shown two, the two major sonnet types for the original Italian or Petrucan and the native English Shakespearean, but are given little indication of the many variants that can be found in the wild. In the continental traditions, as well as in English, both types are normally ambiac pentameter poems of 14 lines. The Italian sonnet is divided into two major parts of eight and six lines each, known as the octave and the sesets, rhyming A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, E, C, D, E, the English sonnet is divided into four major parts, three quatrains plus a couplet, rhyming A, B, A, B, C, D, C, E, E, F, E, F, G, G. Ideally, then, we frequently told the Italian sonnet lends itself to bipartite bipart <clears throat> treatment of a subject. I don't know if that's bipartite. Sorry about that. A description, say, followed by reflections on the scene, or a statement followed by a counter statement. The move at line nine from octave to sestet is then called the turn. Such is the case often enough. I must not think of thee and tired yet strong. I shun the, th the thought that lurks in all delight. The thought of thee, and in the blue heaven's height, and in the dearest passage of a song, oh, just beyond the fairest thoughts that throng, this breast, the thought of we, of thee waits, hidden yet bright, but it must never, never come in sight. I must stop short of thee the whole day long, but when sleep comes to close each difficult day, when night gives pause to the long watch I keep, and all my bonds I need must loose apart. Must off mow my will as raiment laid away with the first dream that comes with the first sleep. I run, I run, I'm gathered to thy heart. The English sonnet, on the other hand, ideally exhibits a tripartite treatment of its subject followed by a snappy closure in the couplet like this. That time of year they Thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bear ruined choirs which, where late the sweet birds sang, in me thou seest the twilight of such day, as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by 
black night doth take away. Death's second self that seals up all the rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie. As the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. So say the textbooks, but the English sonnet, perhaps influenced by its Italian sibling, frequently features a clear turn after line eight, producing a bar bipartite effect. They that have power to hurt and will do, do, do none, they that do not do a th the thing they must do show, who moving others are themselves as stone, unmoved, cold, and do temptation slow. They rightly do inherit heaven's graces and heaven's na hus and husband's nature's riches from expense. They are the lords and the owners of their faces, others but stewards of their excellence. The summer's flower is to the summer sweet, though to itself it only li live and die. But if the, that flower with base infection meet, the basest weed outbraves its dignity. For sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. Here the octave introduces the subject and the sestet, the principal metaphor, and Shakespeare seem, seems to underline the turn with the rhyme of power, line one, and flower, line nine. Such disposition of subject matter neatly within the confines of the rhyme scheme is the rule to be expected, but the account given on dogmatic textbooks overlooks th several things. One is the play of the poet's rhetoric against form. Using enjambment in the manner of Yeats, no second Troy above itself almost sonnet. The textbook use of form tends to be symmetry, neatness, a sense of logic, stability, the same qualities projected by the Augustine heroic couplet. The other lends to the emergent energy of the enjambment and possibly formal instability, as always the fit between continent Content and form is a matter not of the textbook rule, but expressiveness. Milton, whose command, command of the of enjambment in Paradise Lost is exemplary, shows the same power in his sonnets, where he frequently drives his syntax straight through the expected turn. Here, angered by recent political massacre, he employs the sonnet form for a, an unexpected subject. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered stains, saints, who, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold. Even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worship stocks and stones, forget not in thy book record their groans, who were thy sheep and in their ancient fold, slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled, mother with infant down the rocks, their moans, the values redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven, they martyred blood and ashes so, or all the Italian fields where still doth sway, the triple tyrant that from these may grow a hundredfold, or having who having learnt thy way, early may fly the Babylonian woe. Another variable of this is the rhyme scheme itself. Milton's sonnet, one of noti one may notice, uses not the prescribed C D E C D E scheme for the sestet, but C D C D C D. There are many possible rearrangements for the sonnet set or sestet rhymes. I'm sorry. C D E I just said that and so on and so on. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. And poets use them interchangeably. As well a more relaxed octave can introduce a third rhyme. A B B A C 
AACCA. Students are often surprised and confused by these freedoms, but then poets are generally less pedantic to, than students. One comment variant of the sestet CDCDEE -E, produces a hybrid sonnet that begins Italian and ends English, a form much favored by John Donne. ABB, AA, BBA, CD, CDEE. -E. Or the procedure can be reversed, as it is in the one of the most vivid short poems in the language, Yeats Lady and Lita and the Swan, which begins English and ends Italian, A B A B C D C D E F G E F G. A surprising effect is achieved by moving the couplet forward, as in the magical still point of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Silent Noon. Your hands lie open in the long, fresh grass. The finger points through like rosy blooms. Your eyes smile peace. The pasture gleams and glooms. Neath billowing skies that scatter and amass all around our nest, far as the eye can pass, our golden king cup fields with silver edge where the cow parsley skirts the hawthorn hedge. Tis visible silence still as the hourglass. Deep in the sun-scorched growth, the dragonfly hangs like blue, a blue thread loosened from the sky. So this winged hour is dropped to us from above, a clasp we to our hearts for deathless dower. This close companion in in articulated hour when twofold silence was the song of love. Because of the popularity and prestige of sonnet form, poets have tried many variations. Spencer's sonnet, sonnets feature an interlocking rhyme scheme recalling his own Spencerian stanza, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. De a demanding form that has had few imitators, one of Shakespeare's sonnet is, sonnets is written in Ambiana tetrameter. Several of Sidney's hexameter, Hopkins uses accentual meters. Elizabeth Durash syllabic, Milton's on the new forces, forces of the of conscience is a tailed sonnet, an Italian sonnet with several lines appended. Keats, for a joke, wrote a sonnet on the sonnet with nonsensical rhyme scheme A B C A B D C A B C D E D E. County Collins, yet do I mar marvel, begins with two quatrains and finishes with three couplets. Rupert Brooke wrote a sonnet reversed with the couplet at the beginning A A B A B A C D. C D E F E F. Post sonnet silence. His fifteen has fifteen lines. George Meredith's sequence, Modern Love, is made up of sixteen line sonnet like poems. Edna Saint Vincent Miller, Millet's sonnet from An Ungrafted Tree all include with a line of heptameter. Robert Lowell, at the end of his career, produced a large number of 14-line blank verse poems that look and act like sonnets in every way except rhyme. The possibilities are endless, and the student should expect to find poets experimenting, stretching the limits of the textbook rhymes. Excuse me. The French forms. English poetry has borrowed a couple has borrowed a few complex forms from continental models, primarily French, that do normally adhere to textbook prescriptions. Poets who attempt them consciously rise to the technical challenge. These forms all feature types of stanzaic, stanzaic linkage, refrains, double frame, refrains, and the like, and their demands are so se severe that poets treat them as virtuoso challenges, test of skill, and ingenuity. Interest in these forms surfaced first in the continent in the le later medieval and early Renaissance periods. 
arising primarily out of the provincial trubadour doors, whose dazzling range of experimentation in stanza and rhyme were em emulated by poets in other vernacular languages. English poets from Chaucer through Sidney and Spencer in the 16th century imitated several of these forms which then disappeared. They were revived in the later 19th century, spurred by the renewed interest in medievalism and have attracted many formally minded 20th century poets as well. In many cases, the form was treated as a tour de force of light burst until in the hands of a strong poet, it was invested with, a ser with seriousness and depth. The shortest and rarest of these is the Troilet, Triolet, a shorter version of the Rondel, see below, which has the in this space of only eight lines, two refrain lines, A, B, A, 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 B, A, B. The meter is usually iambic, iambic trimeter or tetrameter. Ro kissed me today. Will she kiss me tomorrow? Let it be as, as it may. Rose kissed me today, but the pleasure gives away. To a, civil, to a savior of sorrow, Rose kissed me today. Will she kiss me tomorrow? This unprecedented example shows how conf confining the form is with five of the eight lines determined by two by the two refrains. One might think it impossible to dance in such straight jacket, but see what Thomas Hardy does with the with it in his exceptional double toilet, triolet, the con the coquette, and after. For long the cruel wish I knew that your free heart could ache for me, while mine should bear no ache for you. For long the cruel wish I knew how men can feel and crave to view my triumph fated not to be. For long the cruel wish I knew that your free heart could ache for me. At last one pays the penalty. The woman, women always do. My farce I found was tragedy. At last one pays the penalty. With interest one on when one fancy tree learns love, learns shame of sinners too. At last one pays the penalty. The woman, woman always do. This poem offers a valuable study in extracting multiple meanings and contrastive inflictions from the single frame, simple refrains lines. The result is a poignant, short, dramatic monologue, powerful and dramatic reading. The villanelle more frequently met with also features a double refrain, this time on the same rhyme, A, B, A, 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 A. The meter can be iambic, trimeter, tetrameter, or pentameter, or I suppose any meter a poet can sustain. Like the triolet, this form which was associated with pastoral in French Renaissance poetry was also imported for light verse by minor figures like Austin Dobson. When James Joyce in his novel Portrait of the Artist as a young man wanted to demonstrate his hero's arrival as an artist, he had him produce a villanelle. As you are not weary of ardent ways, lure of the fallen seraphim, Tell no more of enchanted days. Your eyes have set man's heart ablaze, and you have had your will of him. Are you not wary of ardent ways? Above the flame, the smoke of praise goes up from ocean rim to rim. Tell no more of enchanted days, our broken cries and mournful lays. Rise in one Eucharistic hymn. Are you not wary of ardent ways? While sacrificing hands upraise, the chalice flowing to the brim, tell no more of enchanted days, and still you hold your longing gaze with languorous look, 
and lavish limb, are you not weary of ardent ways? Tell no more of enchanted days. Critics still debate whether Joyce intended this poem as a serious sign of his hero's skill or as a parody of late romantic excesses. There is no question of parody, however, in the many fine examples of Villanelle in the 20th century. Robinson's House on the Hill, Auden's Miranda Song from the Sea and the Mirror, William Empson's Missing Dates, Theodore Rotke's The Walking, Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, or Dylan Thomas's celebrated clergy for his father with its moving refrain lines, do not go gentle into the good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. In all these examples, many of many others besides the poets successfully meet the test of motivating the repetitiveness of the form. In Thomas, the refrains dramatized the obsessiveness of grief in Rodkey's The Riddle of Existence, a more recent example, Molly Peacock's Little Miracle, finds formal latitude by contrasting three beat refrain lines against metrically variable free lines and by other licenses with the paradigm. No use getting hysterical. The important part is we're here. Our lives are a little miracle. My hummingbird hearted hearted schedule beats its shiny frenzy day into year no use getting hysterical it's always like that the oracle a human voice could be is shrunk shrunk by fear our lives are a little miracle we must remind ourselves whimsical and lyrical large and slow and clear no good use getting hysterical all words other than i love you are clerical dispensable and replaceable my dear our inner lives are a miracle they beat their essence in coracle our ribs provide the watertight boat we steer through others acid hysterical demands ours is the miracle we're here two related forms the rondelle and the rondeau also occur both like the Millennial employ refrains and only two rhymes, though neither form is observed by poets with quite the same rigidity as the millennial usually is. In its most usual manifestations, the rondel is a poem of 14 lines in which the first two appear as a refrain. A, B, B, A, A, B, A, B, A, B, B, A, B. I'm sorry, A A A B. <laughs> Here is a charming example from the 15th century. My ghostly father, I may, I me confess first to God and then to you that at a widow window, what ye how, I stole a kiss of a, a great sweetness, which done was out of advisedness. But it is done, not undone now. My ghostly father, I me confess. First to God and then to you, but I sh restore it shall doubtless. Again, it so, if so be that I mow and that God I make a vow. Or else I ask forgiveness, my ghostly father. I me confess first to God and then to you. In the 15 line rondeau, the opening word or phrase of the first line appears twice as a refrain. A A B B A. A A B R A A B B A R. A famous example was written by a Canadian soldier who died during the First World War, John McCrae. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, that lark still braver, bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago. We lived, felt, dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in the in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling, failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep through poppies grow in Flanders fields. The most elaborate, prolonged, challenging, in fact, astonishing all these forms, however, is also the most frequently attempted, the sestina, as it 
as its name suggests. The Sistina uses a six line stanza, but unlike the other forms described here, it uses not refrain lines, but refrain words and words repeated in each stanza. The words were not are not repeated in their original order, but according to a strictly prescribed set of mathematical permutations that has to be seen to be believed, the abstract structure looks like this, but I will leave it to the reader to discover the internal logic. One, A, B, C, D, E, F. Two, F, A, B, D, C. Three, C, F, D, A, B, E. Four, E, C, B, F, A, D. Five, D, E, A, C, F, B. Six, B, D, F, E, C, A. At the end, there is a three line in envoy in which all six refrains word ref, six refrain words must be repeated usually f b a d e c the sistina writes <coughs> excuse me ezra pound is like a thin sheet of flame folding and unfolding upon itself this bizarre form was invented in the 20th century by arnott, arnott daniel one of the trovadors of Provence who collectively initiated the European tradition of lyric poetry in vernacular languages. Any curious reader interested in forms whose complexity far exceeds anything in English should look into the provincial troubadours. Are not Daniel's form was imitated by Dante in one of his most celebrated lyrics, Al Pocho Girano and then passed into the modern European languages, all of which are sprinkled with, with sestinas. The technical difficulty of simply meeting these demands is obviously the difficulties of writing of a good sestina, including include motivating the vast amount of repetition. The subject of the poem must be sufficiently haunting or obsessive the, paper, the poet should also find suitable refrain words, words that will determine the tone of the entire poem. Finally, the poet must sustain the subject in a logical development through six stanzas plus envoy. Even so, poets have sometimes increased the difficulties for themselves. Sydney's celebrated Ye Gothered Gods, for example, is a double sestina in which two speakers in dialogue run through the entire set of permutations twice. Auden's Keros and Logos is a sequence of four sestinas, the prize for the most unimaginable refrain words probably goes to Can Canadian poet Earl Burney, whose sestina for the la ladies of Tehintepec triumphantly maneuvers the words hot springs, earthquakes, iguanas, Diaz, Isthmus, and Women. Other fine examples have been written by Swinburne Pound, Muriel Ruckusier, Elizabeth Bishop, Anthony Hecht, John Ashbery, and in free verse, Diane Wachowski. But my personal favorite, despite its rather drab refrain words, remains Rittiard Kipling's Sistina of the Tramp Royal, a dramatic monologue within the confines of the form magically creates the dialect voice of a free spirit folk philosopher. The poem builds to a deeply moving extended simile in the sixth stanza. Speaking in general, I have tried them all. The happy roads that take you o'er the world. Speaking in general, I found them good for such as cannot use one bed too long, but must get earns the same as I have done and go observing matters till they die. What do it matter where or how we die so long as we, we've our elf to watch it all. The different ways that different things are done and men and women loving in this world taking our chances as they come along and when they ain't pretending they are good in cash or credit no it aren't no good you have to have the a bit or you die 
unless you lived your life but one day long, I'm sorry, nor didn't prophecy nor fret at all, but drew your tucker somehow from the world and never, never bothered what you might uh, have done. But God, what th things are they I haven't done? I turned my and to most and turned it good in various situations round the world for I'm the that doth not work must surely die but that's no reason man should labor all is life on this on one same shift life's none so long therefore from job to job I've moved along pay couldn't old me when my time was done for something in my ed upset it all till i add dropped whatever twas for good and out at sea beeld the dock lights die and met my mate the wind that tramps the world it's like a book i think this bloomin world which you can read and care for just so long but presently you feel that you will die unless you get the page you're reading done and turn another likely not so good but what you're after is turn them all god bless this world whatever she hath done except when awful thing long i found it good so right before i die e liked it all all of these fixed forms are of Western European origin, deriving from provincial Italian or French in the past century. However, poets have become aware of poetic traditions from a more global viewpoint. None of these forms is as thoroughly English as the sonnet or even Sistina and all retain, retain specific traits of their cultural origins but they are practiced with increasing fre frequency as repound, despite all his well-earned dis disrepute for anti-sentimentism. Paradoxally, paradoxally merits credit as the first non-Eurocentric major author in our language for his efforts to raise consciousness of the poetry and culture of China and Japan. He was not the first to attempt the Japanese haiku, sometimes spelled haku, but he was the most influential. This brief syllabic form, a three-line unrhymed poem with syllable structure of 575, is now well known in English. Though translators usually discard the syllabic structure and most poets imitate not its formal pattern or its elaborate Japanese conventions, but its paradoxes and logical dislocations, the Zen spirit that underlies the tradition and that seems compatible with Western theories like imaginism. Here are two examples, translations from the first great master of the form, Bashu and later master Isa. <clears throat> On the wide seashore, a stray blossom and the shells make one drifting sand. White sifted mountains reverberates in the eyes of a dragonfly. The form often creates an implied metaphor by juxtapo juxtaposing elements like the tiny ephemeral dragonfly and the huge and unchanging mountain in the second example, the haiku's cousin, the tonka, with a syllabic structure of 57577, appears in even more rarely in English with its form intact. But there is an example by Amy Lowell, roses and larkspur and spl sl slender serried lilies. I wonder whether these are worth your attention Consider it, and if not. From a different source, the Afro-American blues has become another recognizable form, often imitated or incorporated into larger structures, but typically retaining the cry of distress common to the folk's originals. Unlike Afro-American religious spirituals, which have no regular verse form, blues away assuming assume a three-part pattern having two repetitions with variations of the original statement plus a conclusion a variant of the classic german aab bar form familiar from hymns and corollaries langston hughes widow woman is a literary version 
of blues that remains close to the original spirit and form with the radically enjambed lineation pointing the jazz emphasis of the presumed singer. Oh, that last long ride, ride is a ride everybody must take. Yes, that last long ride's a ride everybody must take, and that final stop is a stop everybody must make. When they put you in the ground and they throw dirt in your face, I say put you in the ground and throw dirt in your face. That's one time, pretty papa, you'll sh sh sure stay put in your place. Many other forms have been imported and there is no room to include the, them all. Complex Welsh forms, for example, have often lured English poets, but never to the point, or in my experience, to the point of sustained successful limitation. imitation. The gazelles of several Middle Eastern traditions are couplet poems rhyming on the same rhyme, always signed at the end of the, with the poet's name. The term occurs in English even in the early 20th, 19th century with Thomas More's Gazelle, but Adrian Rich has appropriated it loosely for a number of free verse poems in unrhymed couplets. See, for example, Gazelle's Homage to Galib, and her example has been followed. The Pontorn of Malayan or, or Malayan origins woo, <laughs> is a quatrain version of Terza Terza Rima, in which the second and fourth lines of each stanza rhymes with the first and third of the next. It has not, to my knowledge, been frequently attempted in the past. Louis McNeese's Leaving Barra is perhaps the best known adaptation, but younger poets have begun to pick it up. Here is a recent version of T David Trinidad using not rhymes, but alternating refrain rhymes on the villainal principle. It is almost time to grow up. I eat my TV dinner and watch Nancy Sinatra in 1966, all boots and thick blonde hair. I eat my TV dinner and watch the daughter of Frank Sinatra, all boots and thick blonde hair. She appears on The Ed Sullivan Show. The daughter of Frank Sinatra, she sings the boots are made for walking. She appears on The Ed Sullivan Show. The song becomes a number one hit. All such forms remain exotic until poets collectively have familiarized to the points that their conventions, the expectations, their presuppose are widely known, but this should not discourage writers from imitating whatever forms and genres they may discover in world literature. English poetry has shown in its history a remarkable ability to absorb every kind a formal principle from other languages, and there is no indication that the process has slowed down. The Ode. The term ode is loosely given to any stanzaic lyric that addresses a serious subject with certain degree of elaborate, elaborateness, elevation, or ceremony. As such, it includes many of the most notable and familiar poems in our language. But full of understanding of this multifarious form or term with its often contradictory applications requires a long view of literary history. The con contradictions extend straight back to origins in Greek and Latin poetry where the ode appeared to, in three distinct types. The simplest odes, those of Anacreon and his followers, were short lyrics in simple stanzas on frivolous subjects like drinking. The Anacreontic ode ex explains why the word in English, especially during the Renaissance, sometimes appears in connection with short, such short like poems. The word sonnet is used similarly during the same period. The Odes of Horace, however, often rose above the level of anachronistic treat, treating serious subjects in common lyric stanzas. Andrew Marvell's Horatian Ode upon Cromwell's return from Ireland is a self-conscious English imitation. The type that most concerns us here in relation to English poetic forms, however, is Pandoric Ode. This elaborate form by 
far, the earliest appear originated with the poems of Pindir in the fifth century BC, written, in written to celebrate the victors of the original Olympic games and reappeared in the Korak odes of the Greek tragedy. This is a form in which there are units of three stanzas known as strophe, antistrophe, and epode or turn, counterfeit, and stan. As these terms suggest, the Greek ode performed at formal occasions was not elaborate, long and with a variety of line combinations. The antistrophe repeats the, the strophe exactly, but the epode finds a different structure. This entire threefold pattern can be repeated any number of times. The true Pindor Pindaric Ode is exceedingly rare in English literature. The sole undisputable masterpieces in the form is also the earliest, Ben Jonson's To the Immortal Memory of and Friendship of that Noble Pair, Sir Lucius Carey and Sir Henry Morrison, written to console Carey for the untimely death of his friend. Here to illustrate the pattern is the third and four third of four repetitions of three stanza sequence with the labels as Johnson himself printed them. The turn, it is not growing like a tree in bulk doth make man better be or standing long on oak 300 year to fall a log at last dry bald and sear. A lily of a day is fairer far in May. Although it fall and die that night, it was the plant and flower of light in small proportions we just beauty see and in short measures life may be may perfect be the counter turn call noble lucius then for wine and let thy looks with gladness shine except this garden garland plant it on thy head and think nay no no thy morrison's not dead he leaped at the present age possessed with holy rage to see that bright eternal day of which he, we priests and poets say such truth as we expect for happy men and there he lives with memory and ben the stand johnson who sung this of him ere he went himself to rest or taste a part of that full joy he meant to have expressed in this bright asterism where it were friendship schism, were not his Lucius long with us to tarry, to separate this twilights of the discory, and keep the one half from his Harry, but faith doth alternate the design whilst that in heaven this light on earth must shine. Despite the magnificence of Johnson's poem, I would not take time with its form if it did not have wider consequences though true pindark is most rare its formal influence extends in two directions one is the so-called pseudo pseudo pindaric or irregular ode a form introduced in the 17th century by abraham crawley and widely imitated for two centuries thereafter Crowley was most impressed by the wildness and license of Pindar's language reflected in the Johnson's passage by the radical injumbents. So he wrote poems that mixed line links and rhyme schemes with total abandon, no two stanzas the same. The principle may be seen in the free, irregular, non-repeated stanzas of Dryden, two St. Cecilia odes in cool Coleridge's de dejection, and most notably in Wadsworth Ode on the intim intima intim I'm sorry, intimations of immortality. Before the advent of free verse, the pseudo pindaric Ode offered poets the greatest degree of freedom from formal constraint. The irregularity of the Pindaric Ode is likewise a precedent for elaborate and irregular but repeated stanzas like those in the odes of Keats. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains. My senses, though, of hemlock 
I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. One minute passed and Leith wards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness that thou light wing dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beechen green and shadows numberless singest of summer in, soul, in full thro throated ease. This nonce stanza repeated eight times in the poem seems descended from the irregular irregularity of the pseudo pindaric tradition odes written in complex nonce stanzas like this are quite frequent and this is the end of chapter three <laughs> thank you